Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. For those of you that are on the East Coast, um, good afternoon. This is the Affirmative Action Plan Implementation Webinar. We're going to discuss what you do once your plan is complete. Maybe your plan is in a PDF or a binder, but then there are some additional steps that you need to take to implement your plan and make sure that you're in compliance with additional OFCCP regulations. So we're going to talk first in our plan implementation about data and record keeping. So there are things that you need to do throughout the year, and there are tasks that you need to do once a year. So we're, we gave you a checklist as a handout. You can kind of use that to go along. Um, but the first thing that we want to talk about is record keeping, because your data is key to your affirmative action plan being um, not only in compliance, but making sure that your reports um, reflect the best type of report that you can give the OFCCP if you're audited. So we encourage you to work with your managers and update your job description. Make sure your language is current, and make sure that you have enough job descriptions. Job descriptions that are very generic and don't cover or answer pay equity questions or um, succession plan questions probably need to be updated and you need to expand them a little bit. Um, create your job ads based on your job description. So you need to take a look at your job ads, make sure your job ads have all of the content that is required by OFCCP. One of the sections should be your basic or your um, minimum qualifications for the job. You also want your educational qualifications and all of that. So make sure your job ads reflect what is in your job description. The next area is to update your HRIS data. Run some self-audits and make sure that the employees are in the right title. Are the employees, are, do, are the titles consistent with the EEO codes? and Make sure that if someone has been promoted, that their data has been updated, or maybe they're transferred. Update your IHRIS data. And it's important also to take a look at your drop-down list in your HRIS. So when you're conducting your self-audit, you should have drop-down lists in there. For instance, for um, change, when you do change orders for employees, let's say that they're transferring, they're promoted, um, they have a compensation correction or change. Whatever a change order you're doing, have a drop-down list that reflects what you're doing so that if you have to run a report for the OFCCP, you can run a change order report and be able to separate out the transaction by the specific transaction that happened. The most common transaction is compensation and update, also in promotion update. So stay current with your applicant tracking data. Some companies will wait, and the recruiters will wait, and they have to go back. And oftentimes, we're missing applicant tracking data. If you're doing this manually, keep up with it. We recommend at least monthly, if not by the requisition. And make sure that your applicant tracking includes your dispositions. Um, review and track all FMLA leaves and include your state regulation. OFCCP during an audit has been known to ask for your FMLA log. Make, as most of you have that kept electronically. Make sure that you can produce it if they ask for it. We're going to talk now about letters. So not all of the, the items that we're going to go through on our webinar today are in the correct order on that checklist. So. This first one is your Equal Opportunity Affirmative Action Policy. One CCP regulations require that you put your affirmative action policy in writing in the form of what's called a reaffirmation letter. This means that your top official is reaffirming their commitment to your equal opportunity and your affirmative action policy. The, um, the letter must be signed by the top official. So for those of you that have international headquarters, this is your top official in the U.S. 
should be someone that the, uh, the employees recognize. If you are a multi-site U.S. employer and you have multiple corporations, it can be the corporate head at the site. But it needs to be the top official. It's preferably your CEO or your president. Post this letter where applicants and employees can review it. So it should be on your posting wall, your internet, career page, your intranet, and it should be in your um, new hire packet. So this is your message that you give annually. So it needs to be updated annually. This is another letter that is required. This is called a recruitment source letter. So each of you have recruitment sources for your diversity protected categories, minority groups, females, disabled, and vets. You need to communicate with them. And one of the ways you can do it is with a letter, telling them about your job opening and then re inviting them to work in coordination with you to refer qualified applicants for the job that are diversified applicants. And so you're in, what you're doing is creating a little mini contract. Invite them to assist you in your diversity recruitment efforts. So all of these, this letter can go out via email. I want to go back for a second to the recruitment to the reaffirmation letter. If you have individual employees that are remote, oftentimes sales and marketing, this letter needs to go out via email to each of them. Back to the recruitment source letter. We'll talk about this more during our outreach assessment, but this is a mandatory letter that does need to go out. If you don't send out a letter, you need to call or contact them. This is called a community source letter. This is also a type of a recruitment source letter, but it goes out more to colleges, universities, community action groups, adult schools, high schools, churches. Um, this would be a letter not so much to a recruiter, but to a community source that is helping you to bring in diverse candidates. This also can go out via email. If your company has a union on site, you do need to communicate with the union and invite them to assist you in your diversity recruitment efforts. Now, some of you are recruiting out of the union hall, and some of you are hiring and then sending your employees to the union. So this would be if you are hiring out of the union hall. And you also want to get them to sign the letter that's saying that they will agree to work with you and cooperate with you and then send it back. They usually will do that and they will usually work with you. This letter is called the vendor letter. This goes out to all company vendors that are doing business with you where they're spending 10000 or more on an annual basis. So the purpose that the OFCCP requires behind this letter is to notify your vendors that they may have an affirmative, ap affirmative action obligation because they're doing business with you. By doing business with you, they're considered a subcontractor. So really, the OFCCP doesn't know who all the subcontractors are. And so that's why they require these vendor letters in order to communicate with the subcontractors. So your vendor letter should include their obligation under Executive Order 11246, Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act for Disabled, and VEVRA, which is the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Act, and that covers veterans and disabled veterans. So this letter can also go out via email. Whenever you, you send out these letters, any of these letters, so the reaffirmation letter, recruitment source letter, the community source letter, the union letter, or the vendor letter, keep your letters as exhibits for an affirmative action um, exhibit section because you would have to prove that you sent these out. Let's talk a little bit about mandatory posters. 
you want to make sure you have the most recent posting. Some of these postings are your policies, some of them are your forms, but these are posters that the OFCCP looks for when they come on site. The first thing that you want um, notification you want posted is your reaffirmation letter. Remember that is your policy that's signed by your top official. So each, all of these items should be posted at each facility. Some of you only have one facility, but in that one facility you may have more than one place where you put postings for employees to review. Sometimes it's in the break room, sometimes it's in the hallway, sometimes you have more than one building. Make sure that these letters are available for viewing at each of the places where you normally would put your employee postings. Number two on our list here are your E-Verify posters. If you are using E-Verify, make sure they're up in Spanish and English. And make sure that um, you have, there's more than one E-Verify poster. So you want to put all of those that are applicable. They are available in other languages if those will help your employees. The next item is your memo inspection of your affirmative action plan for disabled and vet. What that is is a mandatory requirement for you to notify your employees that they have a right to view the narrative section of your affirmative action plan for individuals with disabilities and veterans. Let me make a note here is your affirmative action plan as a whole should never be read by employees or, ma or um, most of your managers. It should only be kept in the HR department. It can be viewed by your executive, by HR, or by your um, legal counsel. So this is just a narrative section, remember, of your affirmative action plan for disabled and vets. No statistical analysis, no VET incumbency or disabled incumbency, no EEO1 or VET reports, just the narrative. If you have questions on that, you can send us an email. The next thing that we recommend that you post is your invitation to self-identify for employees and your invitation to self-identify for disabled. Why? Because they may want to change their status. And by posting it, then you have it up there and they, they know what they can ask for. We encourage you to post your equal opportunity policy as well as your harassment policy. Your harassment policy should include your complaint procedure. The next is your EEO is the law poster with the amendments. So the EEO C has created amendments for these and so you want to make sure you have the full set of the EEO policy so there's more than one page. You are required to post the pay transparency poster and this is in the OFCCP website. Um, you want to post your Executive Order 13496, Employment Rights Under the National Labor Law. And then you also want to include your USERA poster, so that's for military. So let's take a look at where you can find all these for a minute. So we're going to go into the internet, into the OFCCP website. This website is not exactly easy to use, so let me give, show you where to go. So you pull up the U.S. Department of Labor website, and right here it says Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. Then you go to the contractors, and you're going over here to workplace posters. You recognize here you also have self-ID forms. But here's our workplace poster section. We'll click on that. And then you come down, and it has EEO as the law, and it has all of the revised sections. And then it also has this section right here. There's pay transparency. And this poster here, click on that one, and it gives you all of these posters that we're recommending that you post. And you might want to post more than what I gave you, but these are the posters and the links to them. So this should help you. So you remember that you go into the OFCCP website, Go to Contractors, 
The drop-down list will come up. Go to Workplace Posters. The first page gives your EEO as the law. Then you go to this for pay transparency, but you go to this little link for other DOL workplace posters, and this will give you some of the others that we took that we listed on in our um, slide. Okay, we're going to go back to our slides here. So we recommend that you post your voluntary self ID for disability and your self ID for race, gender, and veteran status and put a memo up there because you want to explain to them what these are and that they are voluntary so that if the employee does want to change their status, they can submit an updated form and they can come and ask you for it. So you want to put that in the memo, who to ask, what to ask for. The OFCCP has been known to ask how do you communicate with an employee if they want to update any of their self-ID status? So this will answer that question, saying that you post the forms and you go, and there's a memo posted for employees to read it. So we're, what we're doing, trying to do is help you to fill in the gaps in case you're audited, that you're able to answer some of the common questions that the compliance officer can ask during an audit. And this is one of them. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our policy. We recommend that you review and update your employee handbook. The OFCCP can ask to see the entire handbook. They usually don't. They usually ask for specific policies out of your handbook. Um, if we're writing your plan, we will um, tell you which policies those are and what to, what to put into an audit binder if you're audited. But you do want to have your entire employee handbook updated. Employers Group does rewrite handbooks, and so if you're interested in that, you can contact our Service One department. Some of the policies that are commonly requested during an OFCCP audit, and keep in mind they must include federal and state laws, one is the compensation policy. So that's listed right on the itemized listing in the audit scheduling letter. It is not mandatory to have a compensation policy, but they ask for it. So if you have one, make sure you're, you, you're following it. If you're not following it, then don't turn it in. If you have one and you're following it, then it's good to turn it in. If you have a separate, if you have a union on site, you're going to have separate policies for your union employee according to the collective bargaining agreement. So you would need to turn in more than one policy. Some of you are going to have multiple policies depending upon the state that your employees work in. So the state may govern some of these particular details here, and so if the state policy is different than the feds and it's richer, then you might have to turn in more than one policy. The next item is a promotion policy. In the itemized listing on the audit OSCCT scheduling letter, it does list that you document your promotion, promotion process. And so what we want you to do is be able to describe how an individual can be promoted. This is not a mandatory process or policy, but it is oftentimes very detailed and complicated. So you want to make sure that you can describe a promotion to an OFCCP compliance officer. Again, if you have a, promote, a policy in place, make sure you're following it and you're using it with equal opportunity. The next policy that they ask for is reasonable accommodation. This is for individuals with disability. This should be written into your affirmative action plan and followed accordingly, including the interactive process. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But make sure you have a reasonable accommodation policy and that you can produce it. The other thing you want is a religious accommodation policy. I did not list that on here, but it is something that you need to have. So your religious accommodation policy should include how you communicate and what you want from the employee in order for them to request 
a religious accommodation. The next is your paid time off or your sick leave policy. And again, you're going to need to follow your state laws here because your state laws are oftentimes richer than your federal. And some of you need to, to um, be able to produce both. The next is your FMLA policy. That can, and it should include pregnancy leave, and it should include state law. This is your policy on the interactive process. So if an applicant with a disability requests a reasonable accommodation, it is mandatory for you to enter into the interactive process. So a lot of companies we see on the internet are charged with enormous fines and really it's due to the fact that their managers did not enter into the interactive process, but instead they denied a reasonable accommodation or they didn't give a full accommodation and they never communicated with properly with the employees. So you should set up written steps to the interactive process. So we're actually going to give them to you here and this is in the Employers Group Affirmative Action Plan. These are not in order, but it's very important that HR is involved when it comes to reasonable accommodation. Train your managers and make sure that your managers understand what the interactive process is and that they should communicate with you and get you involved. So number one, the interactive process must be timely and documented, so don't wait. When somebody requests a reasonable accommodation, address it immediately. Make sure the documentation is detailed, as though it could be evident in court. Consult with the employee to identify any job-related limitations. Ask the employee for documentation of functional limitations from their medical provider. Now remember, it says ask the employee. So the employee should get the documentation from their medical provider. Identify essential and non-essential functions of the job. Consult with the employee in HR to identify possible accommodations. Research possible accommodations and discuss the options with the employee and the manager. Consult with HR for assistance with research. Implement accommodation that is most appropriate. Okay, we're going to go on and we're going to talk about recruiting and good faith efforts. And this is something, this is an area when we get into audits that we see um, a lot missing. So usually companies have a few recruitment sources listed, but they don't have what the OFCCP is looking for. So you can see the list on the right. The State Employment Office, you need a recruitment source for females. Now, you may need more than one source. So if you have female engineers or female um, managers or operations, depends on what type of line of business you're in. Some of you are um, managing HR for hospitals. Some of you for IT companies. Some of you for nonprofits. Others for manufacturing, etc. So as you're going through these, you're going to need to look for recruitment sources that are going to be best for you for your line of business. You also want to have a recruitment source set up for each of your protected categories under race. So there are recruitment sources for each, and there are more that are out there that are available. You want to be careful that when you're looking at recruitment sources that they're not charging you too much. You want a recruitment source for veterans, for disabled. You want to include universities, local colleges, and you want to make sure you attend job fairs. So when you set up these recruitment sources, make sure that you communicate with them all the information regarding your line of business, the types of jobs you have, etc. So, I mean, we say this every year, but you have to post all your jobs with the State Employment Office. Can you post them with multiple State Employment Offices? Yes. 
So this is a mandatory job posting requirement. So every job, set up an account with your local state employment office. Make sure you set up as a federal contractor. And then follow up with your local veterans rep. So let's, for those of you that are new to this, we're going to take a look at this website. We're going to go into servicelocator.org. When we go down here, we're going to go find a local job center. We're going to put in the employer's group zip code, which is in El Segundo, California, 90245. Go within 24 miles, 25 miles. This pulls up a look at the closest one. Now, we can post with more than one of these. But what we're looking for here is this veterans employment representative. Communicate with that person. Make sure that your account is set up correctly. Now, you may have offices on the East Coast, in the South. You may have offices in Texas. You may have offices in Oregon. You want to make sure you're set up with the state employment office in the area where you have employees, where your sites are. So. When you're setting up something for disabled, we want to give you a couple of recommendations because this is a more difficult area to find recruitment sources that will work with you. Always include your local colleges and universities. Um, you can also go to the, California, to the Department of Rehabilitation. In California, there's a specific site. Um, but you want to go to the site that's best for you in your state. So we'll take a look at the California Department of Rehabilitation so you can kind of get an idea of what to look for in your state. So this is the California Department of Rehabilitation website. It's not Rehabilitation and Correction. OK, so this is their site. Over here it says Find Us. Over here is district and branch offices. Now let's see, we're in Los Angeles County, so we're going to go here. And you can see that there are a lot of locations here. So that we would go into the offices, so we would probably go to the South Bay office here, communicate with them, and look there you see all the different offices that there are for the South Bay. So you can communicate with the Department of Rehabilitation in your state and ask them if they can recommend companies that can help you with your diversity recruiting for individuals with disabilities. We're hoping that will be of assistance to you. The other area you can try searching through the internet, but many times it will be difficult to find those that are not going to charge you a lot. So that's, that's one of the hurdles there. OK, there are, we're going to change subjects now, there are several clauses that you need to have in place. OFCCP specifically looks for these clauses and requests documentation. The first is the EO contract clause by reference only. The purpose of this clause is to notify vendors and businesses that you're doing business with that they may be required to have an affirmative action plan in place. The content of this clause is are, is part of the terms and conditions of your contracts or purchase orders. So it is a drop down. It's going to be just a part. So in your terms and conditions, let's say that you are a manufacturing company. In your contracts, you're going to have terms and conditions for your suppliers of what the content is of that part or that um, process that they're providing you. So this is just a part of the terms and conditions. Some companies use a code of federal regulations, which is what we're going to give to you. Some of companies use the FAR codes, but you need to have the at least abbreviated codes either using the code of federal regulations or the FAR code. Now remember this isn't an HR function. It is the responsibility of the person that writes your contracts or purchase orders or leases.
If you are um, in the real estate business and you are leasing a building out to a federal entity like the IRS maybe is in your building or the or you have an OSHA or even the OFCCP, you are then leasing to a federal agency which makes you a federal contractor. So you have to have these this clause in the leases. This is the EO contract clause by reference only. You can see that the Code of Federal Regulations clauses are listed here, and each of these are several pages long. So this clause in its entirety can be very long. And you can use the entire clause or you can use these codes. This is the job posting clause. Make sure that this is in all of your job postings. The OFCCP will ask to see job postings just to see if this is in your job postings. They want to see it in its entirety. In your job postings, there are sections that you have to have, like I said earlier, that you have to have your basic qualifications and you have to show your educational qualifications, etc. But you also have to have this job posting equal opportunity clause in there. And we suggest that you put this in your job posting template. For those of you that are posting jobs electronically, you should have these job posting clauses set up so that you can check the box to include them. But don't forget to include them. Don't forget to check the box. If you can get your third party administration to have them automatically put in every job posting, that's really what you want. This, in addition, should be in, in um, all of your job postings if you're doing an electronic posting. But this disability clause should also be on your website career page. OFCCP compliance officers want to see it right up front on your career page because this is for individuals with disabilities that are applying for your jobs and they're looking for employment, but they're having difficulty getting through the applicant process and they need assistance. And they need to know how they can contact someone. So not only do you need to have this on your career page, but you need to have someone listed on here that you can contact. Well, for those of you that have very large companies, we recommend that you have a dedicated email and phone number that is actually managed by an individual that can communicate with these people. Because if you have a career page that covers all of your sites, and it may, they may be international, you need to have something where they can communicate. And I'm sure if you're doing business in the UK or France or Japan or one of those other countries, and you put a clause on there like this, um, that they would also appreciate that different countries also have disability clauses. So this is not something that you can't do internationally. Let's talk a little bit about the OFCCP outreach assessment. If you haven't done this, you need to do it and you need to document it. So this is one of those areas that is in addition to your affirmative action plan. You have to make new friends with your outside recruitment sources. So you say to me, well, I don't have time to do that. You have to do it and you have to document. So we're going to show you a little bit about what this is and how to do it. So this is outreach that cannot be done by sending jobs through a job aggregator or distribution tool to be posted on diversity websites like some of you are using. So you're using outside vendors to post your jobs. You have to build relationships with your outside recruitment sources. So if you're manually posting jobs, it's a little easier to do that. But if you're using a third-party vendor, that third-party vendor will have software to do the outreach assessment. You must communicate with your third-party vendor and ask them to teach you to use their out outreach assessment tool. For those of you on the line that are manually doing this and you, you're not really sure what we're talking about, a, an outside vendor, there are companies that will post your jobs for you and they will post them all different directions fulfilling the obligation to post jobs. 
for minority groups, females, disabled, and vets. But they cost money. What they do is they come into your website and they scan your website and the new job postings every day. And then they post them many different directions. These um, companies, vendors do work, but if you're using one, you have to build relationships which eat with each of the recruitment sources that your vendor is using. Your vendor cannot do this for you. So you want to have documentation for your outreach. So this is called outreach. So you recruit where you sent, you post your jobs. Then you, your outreach is to your recruitment source vendors. It is not outreach to applicants. So you have to Prove your good faith efforts, and you have to prove your outreach. Um, document any communication that you extend to your recruitment sources by letter, by email. If you're making phone calls, you might be having site visits where you invite that representative to come to your site to see the types of jobs you have and just see the line of business that you're working in. And you might be attending job fairs. Document, document, document. We've had a um, company get a violation for not doing that. Let's talk a little bit about the form that you need to have in place and talk about the implementation of some of these. Update all of your forms for content. Make sure they're current. All of your change requests should have a drop-down list that matches them in your HRIS system. And we have a lot of problems with this when we request promotion data. So in your change request, and a lot of you will have these in connection with your payroll provider or your HRIS system. When you have a drop-down list, there are different changes that you're going to make to the data. One of them is a title change. Why did you change the title? Well, it was a promotion. Well, then it should have a drop-down list that says it's a promotion, or it was a transfer, or it's a union job bid, and the person was actually promoted, due, and their job bid was, the, was accepted. Maybe it's a schedule change. Maybe it's a shift change. Um, in a union environment, a shift change may be a promotion. So make sure that your change request matches your drop-down list in your HRIS system so that when we come back and ask you for your promotions, it's already in there. And this is something that, this is a very common issue. And I would say 90% of the companies do not have a detailed drop-down list to cover changes. So when you are doing a transfer, and you have more than one site, that person wasn't terminated, that person was transferred. So maybe they are terminated in your payroll system because your payroll system for site A is different than site B. So you terminate them from site A and hire them in site B. It is not a termination and a hire, it is a transfer. So something needs to show that somewhere. So make sure you update your drop-down list. Confirm that your managers know what you want them to use on the change request form. And you have to train change train managers. So this is one of the areas. I know they don't like paperwork, but it's what they do. So when you are asking them to fill out forms, tell them what you want in the training. This is how you want, we want you to fill this out. They need to dot their I's and cross their T's because these forms are requested by the OFCCP. They can be used as evidence in court. They can be requested by the EEOC or any other Department of Labor office, including your state office. If you're in California, you're subject to audits by DFEH. Very, very stringent audits. So make sure that the change forms are correctly filled out. And then your change requested forms, if they're asked for by the OFCCP, they want to see specifics. So you've got to remember that they're going to try to charge you with discrimination. So your change request forms 
for compensation, for instance, or maybe promotion, or maybe even demotion, maybe the proof of what happened with that employee, if the employee has signed any of the forms, like exit paperwork, then that protects you. So make sure your change request forms are updated. So this one, a performance review forms, is really critical. We had a company get um, charged pretty high dollar fines, and they had to go through mandatory training because their performance review process and their performance review forms were not correctly used by the management team. So the content needs to be correct, and the managers need to know how you want them to use them. So usually HR will govern this process, although you don't always implement the process. So they need to understand how to use them, and they need to use them the same between different departments. If you have a matrix in your form, so for instance, if you are an outstanding performer, you get a 5% increase. If you are a fair performer, you get a 3% increase. If you're a poor performer, you maybe get 1% to 0%. Everybody that's a manager needs to know how to implement that matrix, and they need to do it consistently. They can't give more of a percentage if they don't have the performance scores, and you can't go back and say, well, we really like this person. I'm going to give them a better score than they reserve, so they deserve, so they get a better increase. That, that doesn't work in an OFCCP audit. So you want to be make sure that your managers are filling these forms out correctly. These are very commonly um, requested in an OFCCP audit, especially when we're talking about availability for promotion or compensation increase. We're dealing with pay equity. How come she is making more than he is? Well, she is a better performer. Well, that's not what the performance review says. So you want to make sure that whatever you say to the compliance officer, you can back it up with proper forms and documentation. Voluntary self-ID forms are also something that you need to update. So for instance, the voluntary self-ID for disability in the top right, it has an expiration date of 2020. If you're using the older form with the expiration date of January 2017, you have the wrong form. And they are looking for um, implementation of the most recent forms. So you should have a voluntary invitation to self-ID for applicants that's pre-offer. And it's going to have a different uh, paragraph on the top than it would be for those that are post-offer for employees. You should extend a voluntary self-ID as early in the applicant process as is possible. Um, you should extend a voluntary self-ID to your employees post-offer, and you need to do a resurvey. The voluntary self-ID form for disability is a mandatory form to use, but it's also a government form. So let's show you where you can find that. So we're going to go back to the OFCCP website. No, it's going to go around in a circle a minute. We go to the contractor section to the drop-down list to the self-ID forms over here. And here you have self-ID forms in other languages. And then you have the self-ID forms in Spanish and English. So you can use these forms. This is the Voluntary Self-Identification of Disability form. So this is the form that you can use, and you have to use their form. It is mandatory to use, and you cannot change it. You cannot alter it. You cannot alter the font. It is set up that way in order for individuals with disabilities to use it, and it's set up for readers and scanners. And in your, if you have an electronic application in on the internet so there it's your employment application you do have to ask for the self ID questions and 
we recommend that if you're using an online application that you make your self-ID form um, section a mandatory section to complete. And a lot of people are in hurry, so make, make this mandatory. In order to do that, you have to have your IT specialist set up an additional checkbox that says, I decline to self-ID. But if you make this mandatory, more people are going to fill it out. So we've had companies where 50% of their workforce, they have no self, there's no race or gender. But you can't turn in your EEO1s, your affirmative action data is skewed. So you want to make sure that you can collect this data. The best way to do it is to make it a mandatory field, but again, you have to give them this additional out, which says, I decline to self-ID. You must conduct a self-ID resurvey. So if you haven't done that, you're required to do it in uh, after March 24, 2014, mm -hmm. once every five years, and once in between. So in between is 2017 is a good time to do it. So if you haven't done it, uh, make sure that you use the self-IDs for disability, we recommend that you put the ones in for race, gender, and vet status in there as well, because that way you can update your system. And then document the employees that received the survey. The, they should have a confidential place to return them to you. So this is something that can be done over electronically over your intranet, um, but the self-ID for disability, remember, can't be changed. If you haven't done your resurvey, you need to do it. And it's a good time to do it now if you haven't already filed your VETS 4212. So if you don't, you know, you want to see who your VETS are and you maybe need to update your data, this is a good time to do that. Okay, so we're going to talk lastly about our training. The OFCCP often asks in audits, um, they'll ask managers in on-sites, when was the last time you received affirmative action training and, and they'll they'll look at them, you know, and say, well, I don't remember or something. But make sure that you train your managers. You're supposed to do it at least annually. Um, include your supervisors and people that are decision makers. So if they are not they if they are not in the process of hiring, promoting, terminating, or compensating, then don't include them. Include your decision makers, because these are the ones that you want to make sure understand the OFCCP regulations and exposures and audits. Train your HR team. Make sure that your HR team is trained and includes your HR payroll and your recruiters. Um, if your recruiters have not taken our applicant tracking webinar, please forward the invitation to them and make sure they take it. If your payroll has not taken the pay equity webinar, make sure they take it and HR should take them all. And make sure you train them and we do do training for supervisors and managers, we do training for HR departments, and we do training for recruiters. So if you're interested in additional training, we have an online um, training module, and we also come on site, and we'll do webinars. Now, I'm sure all of you are doing your sexual and other harassment training, but the OFCCP will ask managers, when was the last time your company conducted sexual and other harassment training? So hopefully they say every two years. So we had, you know, if you haven't done it every two years and you're in California, you need to make sure they've taken the AB 1825 sexual harassment training. Check your state laws if you're not in California and keep your sign-in sheets because you need to prove that they participated. And so employers group does have a training module for this. If you haven't done it recently, you can ask our, our service one department to set you up and you can do online training and we'll track it. You can use your system, our system, but make sure it's done. This is pre-employment testing. Um, if you have any kind of pre-employment test, you need to have them statistically validated. 
If you get into an audit and you have adverse impact and you have not validated your test, you can be in trouble. So make sure they're validated. So you want, you have to have development of your procedure, your validity studies, and consideration given to alternative set selection criteria and reasons for rejection. So you must be able to provide test validation to the OFCCP if you're audited. You also can um, be required to provide test validation in court if you're if you have a case where you're um, charged with any kind of discrimination. So you want to make sure there are outside testing companies that will validate your test for you. This at the bottom is a website is the dol.gov website that talks about test validation. These mostly are pre-employment tests. Um, but you do want to make sure that you check your selection criteria and all the others. Are they uniformly applied? Are they consistent with business necessity? And are they validated as job related? So all of these areas must be tested. And the outside companies will do this. For instance, they'll do companies for math tests at different grade levels, depending upon the job that you're testing. So let's say we had one company that's painting Navy jets. Well, they have a math test because they have to be able to do fractions to me of, of measurement in order to mix paint. Now, that's a test validation that is not a math algorithm that's complicated. So it depends upon what type of a math test that you're putting in place. And you're going to have other tests that you might want to put in place because they're necessary for your line of business, especially if you're in the medical field. So if you have tests, make sure they're validated. Employers group member can communicate with Service One for more information on becoming a member. There are some good perks to being a, an employers group member. And you can call our helpline all week long, ask HR questions, and receive assistance from some of your questions that you're just not sure about. You can get forms, you can get policy updates. So if you are not a member, contact us today and get more information.